is uh, about a logic of quantified statements or predicative logic. So let's return back to our original example. And at the beginning of the semester, this was the example that we started with. All men are mortal, Socrates is a man, and Socrates is mortal. But now if we look at the first sentence, the first sentence, which is an implication, doesn't state anything about Socrates. It states that all the men are mortal. Now, it is true that if this property is, property is true for all men, then we can also instantiate that uh, quantifier all with Socrates. And then it would say, if Socrates is a man, then Socrates is mortal. And that actually is what is called universal instantiation. That in a universal statement, in a statement that states a property for all uh, elements in a domain, then that property is true for any one of the elements in that domain. So last class, last two lectures, we talked about propositional calculus, which is also the analysis of ordinary compound statements, basically composed statements out of propositional variables, out to atoms. Predicate calculus is the symbolic analysis of predicates and quantified statements that contain variables. And we'll talk about the different quantifiers uh, that we have in first order logic for all or universal quantifier for all X and the existential quantifier there exists an X. Now, instead of using propositions, in predicate calculus, we are going to use predicates, and predicates have arguments. So we are going to use letters like P for the predicate symbol, and really what it stands for is for a sentence that has a missing or multiple missing elements. In our case, let's assume as an example that the statement, the pre pre uh, pro uh, predicate P stands for it it is a student at Stony Brook University. And then when we instantiate it with X, an argument X, P of X, P of X stands for X is a student at Stony Brook. And X is a variable. So now we, are, uh, we have a statement with a free variable that basically says that someone is a student at Stony Brook. Okay. So P is called a predicate symbol and x is a predicate variable and we'll talk more about these predicate variables a little bit later so a predicate is a sentence that contains a finite number of variables and becomes a statement like propositions that we learned last class where specific values are substituted for those variables for all of those variables the domain of a predicate variable is the set of all the possible values that that predicate variable can take. That all the possible values that can substitute in place of that predicate variable. Okay. So, for instance, if p of x is the predicate x squared is greater than x, x has the domain, the set of real numbers. And now, we didn't quantify anything here. So if we are said, uh, we are told x squared is greater than x, it has a free variable x. If x is 2, so we are actually forming the p of 2 uh, 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 statement, it is 2 squared greater than 2, which is a true fact in arithmetics. 4 is greater than 2. If x is one divided by two, 0 0.5, then P of one divided by two is one divided by two square is greater than one divided by two. But one divided by two square is one divided by four, a quarter, and the quarter is not greater than a half. So that statement would be false. So P of X is a predicate and we can instantiate X. Until now, we didn't talk about quantifiers, only that some predicates may contain variables. And we can also form uh, composed uh, predicates by using conjunction, disjunction, negation, implication. 
Now, given such a predicate, we can compute out of the domain the set of values for which that predicate is true. So if P of X is a predicate and X has the domain D, the truth set of P of X over that domain D is the set, and we use this right at the beginning where we had the set notation that I want from the domain D all of the values X such that P of X is true. And that is called the truth set of that predicate. It's the set of all the elements from the original domain that makes P of X true when they are substituted for that variable X. For instance, assume that Q of X is the predicate N is a factor of eight over the domain of uh, where N, the predicate variable N has as domain Z, the set of all integers. Then the truth set of Q of N is one, two, four, eight, minus one, minus two, minus four, minus eight. Because those are all the possible factors, all of the possible substitutions of N that makes this predicate true, that they basically are factors of eight. They can be multiplied with another integer, and then the result of that product is eight. So the truth set is the subset of the domain that makes uh, that for every value that predicate is true. And now we can get into the universal and uh, existential quantifier. Really what the universal quantifier says, it says that the truth set of uh, that variable for that predicate is the domain itself. So the predicate is true for the entire domain. And that's what the universal quantifier says. Okay? But let's talk about what are quantifiers. Quantifiers are words that refer to quantities, like sum or all, and tell how many elements that given predicate is true. So we saw in the first example, all men are mortal. This is a, all is a quantifier. It states that for all X that are men, X are mortal or is mortal, okay? So the first quantifier that we are going to learn is the universal quantifier. And this is the symbol for the universal quantifier and is called for all. And as an example, we have below that sentence, all human beings are mortal for all human beings X, X is mortal. So it basically states that if H is the set of all the human beings for all X that are members in H, X is mortal. And you can replace is mortal with a predicate M. And really then you can write a logical formula that says for all X in H, M of X is true. So let's, a universal statement is a statement where you have a universal quantifier for all X in some domain D, and then you have a logical formula like Q of X. Q of X could be a predicate, or it could be a more complex logical formula. A universal statement is basically of this form. Now, such a universal statement is true if and only if Q of X is true for every element X in D. So it actually follows the definition of what this universal quantifier is. It's for all the elements in the domain, Q of X is true. So this such a formula is true, if and only if is true for all of the elements in the domain. Such a formula is false if and only if Q of X is false for at least one element in the domain. And that element could be called counterexample. So basically, we'll, if we want to prove that the universal statement is false, we have to give at least one counterexample, one for which that formula is false. So now let's see an example where a universal formula is true. So consider the following formula for all X in the domain D, X squared is greater than X, where D is the set one, two, three, four, five. And really what it means that this formula is true for every one of the elements in the domain. So one square greater than one is true, two square greater than two is true, three square greater than three is, three is true, 
4 square 16 is greater than 4, and 5 square 25 is greater than equal with 5. It's all true. So we can see that greater than equal is true for all of these uh, elements in the domain. Therefore, by the first definition, this formula is true for all x in the domain D, x squared greater than x is true for all of the elements in that domain. So universal statements are true when they are true for all of the elements in the domain, and they are false when at least one element in the domain is a counterexample. Basically, the statement is false. The existential quantifier is the second quantifier that we'll discuss about today. It's represented by this symbol, which is like an inverted E, capital E, and is read as there exists or for some. Like in this example, there is a student in CSC 215. So let's say that I want to say a phrase that there is a student in CSC 215 who's international or something else. Uh, then we are, I'm using an existential quantifier. There exists a person P such that P is a student in CSC 215. Or there exists a person P member of the set uppercase P, which basically P is the set of all the people such that P is a student in CSC 215. Okay. So existential quantifier is basically this symbol that is put in front of variables. And the meaning is that there exists an at least one for which uh, that predicate is true. Like in the case of universal statements, we have existential statements. It's a statement that starts with an existential variable, like oh, there exists an x in the domain D, such that q of x is true. q of x is the predicate. D is the domain of the variable x. And such a formula is true if and only if q of x is true for at least one x in the domain D. Such a formula is false if and only if q of x is false for all of the elements in the domain D. So basically, there exists no element for which uh, q of x is true. So let's see an example. We are given that for, there exists an x in integers such that m squared is equal with, uh, there exists an m in integers such that m squared is equal with m. Existential quantifier only needs at least one element in the domain. So there are two, as you know, zero square is equal with zero, uh, and also one square is equal with one. But we only need one, because if it's true for at least one, then the formula must be true. So yes, it's true, because we can find that m could be equal with one, an integer, and one square is equal with one. I'm using a notation st for such that. Uh, it's just for, for, to be concise. So uh, I've seen it in the past when I taught this class that uh, they, some students were asking, what is st? Uh, I don't want to write after each existential uh, quantifier such that. I will just use st. But you can also put comma. There exists an x, comma, q of x. So I understand that. That's what we are using for universal quantifier, by the way. But it makes easier to read when you do have the such that. Uh, there exists a student such that he gets an A, or there exists a student such that uh, he's a domestic student or something like that. OK. So what's the relation between these universal quantifiers and, exist and uh, disjunction and conjunction? And really, I should actually put it on the next line because it's easier to see. What's the meaning of for all? And what's the meaning of there exist? Okay, let me put it like this. It's easier to read. Uh, probably if I increase the size. Okay, save it. And basically what we have here is that if the domain is finite, then we can rewrite the universal quantifier as a conjunction for all of the values in that domain. So for all x in the domain d q of x is logical equivalent with 
q of x1 is true and q of x2 is true and q of x3 is true and so on up to q of xn is true. So a universal quantifier actually transforms into a conjunction of all of the elements in the domain. So for all x in the domain d q of x is true, is true when the conjunction of q of x1 of xi for all of the elements in the domain is true. Similarly, there exists an element x in the domain d such that q of x is equivalent with a disjunction. It's either that q of x1 is true, or q of x2 is true, or up to q of xn is true. It's an inclusive or. It basically says that this formula is true if at least one of the elements in the domain makes uh, the disjunction true. So these two quantifiers for finite domains can be rewritten out into all of the possible disjunctions and conjunctions. In fact, this is what we did in this case when we wanted to prove that for all x in the domain D where the domain D was one, two, three, four, five, x squared is greater than x, we transformed it into a conjunction that is true for all of the elements in the domain. Therefore, the universal quantifier over that domain must be true. So really what universal quantifier is, is a conjunction and existential quantifier is a disjunction saying that at least one must be true, okay? Feel free at any moment, if you have a question related to the current slide to ask it, because I will only stop from 10 in 10 minutes or 15 minutes or even longer to check if there are questions in the chat. Since I don't hear anything, I will just continue. So the next type of interesting uh, logic statements in predicative logic that uh, we will discuss about are universal conditional statements. They have the standard form for all x, if p of x, then q of x. And as an example, if a real number, for all real numbers, if a real number is greater than two, then its square is greater than four. And we can write it in logic as follows. For all x in reals, so that's the universal quantifier, then we have a condition, an implication. If x is greater than two, then x squared is greater than four. So we basically have this form for universal conditional statements. Now, uh, we talked about the way that universal uh, is connected to conjunction, but what if actually uh, the elements for which the premise, in this case, P of X, are all false? So this statement, if for all of the elements that are quantified over X, P of X is false, false implies anything is true. So if there are no elements for which P of X is true, the universal statement is actually true. This universal statement states nothing about if P of X is true or not. And that takes us to this statement. So let's assume that we have this situation. We have a bunch of balls, uh, which can be blue or gray, and a single ball that has no balls in it. And now we are uh, told the sentence, all of the balls in the ball are blue. So now, is it true or false? And we can write it in logic that for all of the x in the domain, in our case, for all of the balls, if p of x, then q of x. p of x means the ball is in the ball. And q of x is that the ball is blue. Is this a true statement? And in this case, it is. And it is actually called vacuously true or true by default. Because there are no balls in the ball, which basically makes P of X false for all possible elements in the domain. Therefore, false implies anything is true, and the universal statement is true. So this statement is actually true, because if you look in that ball, there are no balls. And it is true that everything that you see inside the ball is blue, uh, because there are there is no ball in the ball. 
Any questions? Okay. Now, there are other things that we have to talk about. So earlier we talked about the truth set of a predicate. Now we can actually transform that truth set into the domain. So if we have a universal conditional statement of the fact for all x in the universe, if p of x, then q of x, and we compute the truth set of p of x, let's say, let's say that is the domain D, then that, that conditional statement, universal conditional statement, can be written as a universal statement for all x in the domain D, q of x. Because we narrowed the universe u to the domain D that is the set of all the values of the variable x that makes p of x true. So for instance, a statement of the kind for all x, if x is a square, then x must be a rectangle, can be rewritten into for all squares x, x is a rectangle. Because basically we reduce the domain from all possible geometric objects to the squares. And it is true that for all of the individual squares, they are rectangles. Similarly, existential statements can be written in the same way. So if we have there exist an x such that p of x and q of x, it can be rewritten into the form there exist an x in the domain D such that q of x, where D consists of all of the values that the variable x can take uh, that make p of x true. So instead of having the outer statement that states that for there exists an x for which both p of x and q of x is true, we have there exists an x in the domain D, which contains only values for which p of x was true, such that q of x is true. Okay. So we can think of another example similar to the one that I had above for the universal statement. There exists an x such that x is either a square or a red. And now we transform it into there exists a square that is red. Okay. So basically, you take the elements from for which the first uh, operand of that conjunction are true and you make it the new domain. Also, another notation that the textbook uses, and I will use in some of the examples in the recitations, is called implicit quantification, where the variables in the formula are not explicitly quantified, but the meaning is that they are universally quantified in the entire formula. The notation is the arrow with two lines instead of the, uh, the uh, single line implication or B implication. So P of X implies Q of X means that for every element in the truth set of P of X is also in the truth set of Q of X or equivalently that for all X, P of X implies Q of X. And similarly for B implication, basically Q of X and uh, P of X have the same truth sets or equivalently that for all X, P of X, B implication, Q of X. P of X has the same value with Q of X because only in those cases, B implication is true. Now, we also have to think about negation. So negation can be applied on any logical formula that was previously defined, including those that are quantified. The negation of a quantified statement of the form for all X in the domain Q of X is the logically is logically equivalent to ex, there exists an x in the domain such that not q of x is true. So basically, the negation of a universal statement is the existential statement of the negation of the inner formula. So, for instance, if we have a statement, all the mat all mathematicians wear glasses. Its negation will be that there is a mathematician who doesn't wear glasses. So it's very important to see that what makes a universal statement false is actually if the existential statement of the negation is true. And vice versa, a universal statement is true if the negation, if, if 
the existential statement of the negation uh, of the inner statement is uh, false. So it's very important to see that when we push negation over a quantifier, like universal in this case, we get a, an existential quantifier. In the, our example, all mathematicians wear glasses, the negation of that statement is not no mathematician wears glasses, is that there exists at least one mathematician that doesn't wear glasses. And we'll see that they, they are basically equivalent. Uh, uh, the universal statement of uh, a predicate and the existential statement of, of its negation. So when you push negation through one of these quantifiers, it becomes the other one. And that we can see also for existential quantifier. The negation of a statement that contains an existential statement, there exists an X in the domain D, such that q of x is logical equivalent to for all x in the domain d, not q of x. And here is the logical equivalence. We have not or of their existent x in the domain q of x is equivalent for all of the elements in the domain, not q of x. And again, think of a standard statement of the kind, some snowflakes are the same. Its negation is no snow, uh, no snowflakes are the same, which means all snowflakes are different. Okay, so the from basically existential quantifier, the negation of that existential quantifier becomes a universal quantifier of the negation. So all snow, no snowflakes are not the same. Okay. So now we can actually see more examples. So let's uh, take a statement, all prime numbers P, P is odd. The negation of that statement is there exists a prime number P such that P is not odd. And we can actually see that this is true. There is a prime number which is two that is not an odd number. So it is not true the statement that all the prime numbers are odd. Similarly, the negation of there exists a triangle T such that the sum of the angles of the triangle equals 200 degrees is for all of the triangles T, the sum of the angles is not 200 degrees. And again, it's a, so the existential statement was false and the negation, which is a universal statement is true. It's true that for all the triangles in the Cartesian plane, Euclidean geometry, uh, the sum of the angles is not 200 degrees, it's 100 degrees. The negation of the statement for all politicians X, X is not honest, is there exists a politician X such that X is honest. And we did it by double negation because the negation of the universal statement was existential statement, there is a politician X such that is not true that X is not honest, and now we have double negation, so it must be the case that X is honest. The negation of, for all computer programs P, P is finite, is there exists a computer program P such that is not finite, such that P is not finite. The negation of there exists a computer hacker C that C is over 40 is equivalent with, for all computer hackers C, C is under 40, is 40, 40 or under 40. The negation of there exists an integer n between 1 and 37 such that 1357 is divisible by n is for all of the integers n between 1 and 37, this number 1357 uh, is not divisible by n. So again, pushing a negation over a quantifier changes it into the other quantifier and now the negation is on the inner formula. Okay. Now let's look at uh, the negation of a conditional, of a universal conditional statement. It's not true that P of, uh, that uh, the negation of for all X, P of X implies Q of X. It becomes there exists an X such that P of X and 
not q of x. And how did we do that? So first of all, we pushed once the negation in. So we got the negation of for all x, p of x implies q of x, is there exists an x such that the negation of p of x implies q of x. But now the negation of p of x implies q of x is the negation of the inner uh, the logical equivalent formula to this implication. So p of x implies q of x is logical equivalent with not p of x or q of x. And now we have the negation of that disjunction. By the Morgan rules, we have the double negation of p of x and the negation of q of x. So we pushed in negation, the disjunction became a conjunction and we had two negations. The double negation of p of x is p of x and the negation of q of x remains in place. So now we basically have the negation of for all x, p of x implies q of x, is there exists an x such that p of x and not q of x. And let's see an example. For all people p, if p is blonde, then p has blue eyes. The negation of that is there exists a person p such that p is blonde and p doesn't have blue eyes. So we have the original premise and the negation of the conclusion of that implication. Similarly, the negation of for all programs, if a computer program has more than 100,000 lines, then it contains a bug, is there exists at least one computer program that has more than 100,000 lines and doesn't contain a bug. So basically, the part in the if, the condition in the if becomes is still true, and the, con the conclusion after then becomes not true. So not doesn't contain a bug. Okay. Good. Now, when we talked about uh, propositional logic, we actually saw that there are equivalent logical formulas that are equivalent to implications. So for instance, given a universal conditional statement for all x in the domain D, if P of x implies Q of x, the contrapositive, which is actually logically equivalent with, with the original implication, is for all x in the domain D, if not Q of x implies then not P of x. And below is basically the fact that the original implication for all x p of x implies q of x is equivalent with for all x not q of x implies p of x. And again, the way to do it is that if you have a domain, now for every element in the domain, that formula must be true. But the formula is logically equivalent with its contrapositive internally. So basically the inner equivalence maintains the fact that p of x implies q of x is logical equivalent with not q of x implies p of x. Now there are two more formulas which are related, related, not logical equivalent, to implication. So if we had an original implication for all x, p of x implies q of x, its converse is for all x, q of x implies p of x. And its inverse is for all x, not p of x implies not q of x. And like we actually learned in uh, propositional statements, the converse is actually equivalent with the inverse. Okay? And here we have examples. If the original implication was for all x in reals, if x is greater than 2, then x squared is greater than 4. Its contrapositive is for all x in reals. If x squared is less than equal with 4, then x is less than or equal with 2. And this it's logical equivalent with its uh, uh, original implication. So this logical equivalence between the original implication and contrapositive is maintained. The converse is for all x in the reals for that uh, uh, implication that we saw before. If x squared is greater than 4, then x is greater than 2. That's basically just swapping the if part with the then part, and the converse, which is a logical formula equivalent to the converse, the inverse is for all x, if x is less than or equal with two, then x squared is less than or equal with four. 
also we defined necessary and sufficient conditions and only if. So necessary conditions. We say that for all x, r of x is a necessary condition for s of x, means that for all x, not r of x implies not s of x. So r of x is necessary for s of x, means that if we don't have r of x, we don't have s of x. And this logical equivalent by contrapositive and double negation with for all x, s of x implies r of x. Why? Because basically by contrapositive, we are getting that the double negation of s of x implies the double negation of r of x, and the double negation gets eliminated, and we get s of x implies r of x. So r of x is necessary to for q for s of x is basically in, written in logic as s of x implies r of x. Sufficient condition means that 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 uh, predicate r of x is sufficient to prove s of x. So really, what it means is that r of x implies s of x. So for all x, r of x is net sufficient for s of x means for all x r of x implies s of x. And here we have two examples. Squareness is a sufficient condition for rectangularity. It really means that for all x, if x, x is a square, then x is a rectangle. Being at least 35 years old is a necessary condition for being the president of the United States. Is for all x, if x is younger than 35, not older, then x cannot be the president, is logical equivalent for, with for all x, if x is the president, then x is at least 35 years old. And that's done by contrapositive. These are examples from the lecture notes. I didn't compose them. Only if. For all x, r of x, only if s of x means for all x, s of, not s of x implies not r of x which again by contrapositive is for all x, r of x implies s of x. So basically r only if s means r implies s. A product of two numbers as an example is zero only if one of the numbers is zero, basically is equivalent with if neither of the two numbers is zero then the product is not zero which is logically equivalent with if the product is zero, then one of the numbers must have been zero. But that, that, that is done by contrapositive, okay? Now, lots of sentences that you will see in natural language have multiple quantifiers, okay? Like for instance, in a supply chain application, one person, the CEO says, there is a person supervising every detail of the production line. What's the meaning of that? Now, in natural language is a little bit ambiguous because in natural language, you do not have the requirement that you have in logic that quantifiers are executed from left to right. So it may mean actually two different things in English. It may mean that, which is actually what we have in, if in logic, if we translate this sentence, there is one person that supervises all of the details of the production process, or the original sentence in natural language may also mean that for any particular production detail, there is a person that supervises that detail. But these supervisors may be different for different details. Okay? So natural language is ambiguous. When someone says something like this, there is a person supervising every detail, actually may mean the second sentence. But logic is clear. In logic, when we are given a sentence in logic, we know that the quantifiers are executed left to right. So such a sentence has a single meaning, which is the first meaning in our case, that there is a person, one single person that supervises all of the details of the production process. But you see the difference because in natural language, many people actually use that sentence that we have up there for the second meaning, that every production process is supervised by a person, okay? So there exists a person for every one of the production processes to, to supervise it. 
So natural language is ambiguous, and that's why it's not in general used for uh, logical proofs or basically doing computing or justifying answers. So in logic, quantifiers are performed in the order in which the quantifiers occur. If we have a sentence like for all x in a set D, there exists a y in the set E such that x and y satisfy some properties, property, it really means that for every element in the domain D, we can find a different element in the domain E such that P of x is true. So the order of quantifiers matters. If we now swap the two quantifiers, it's a completely different formula. It says that there exists an element y in the set E that for all of the elements in the domain D, y is in that relation with x. So there is a single y if that formula would have the quantifier exist as the first one. Okay. And we'll see a these examples using a standard example in logic named after Alfred Tarski. He was a professor at UCLA, uh, originally from Poland, that basically wrote a set of uh, research papers and the textbook that I have in my office on uh, basically quantified logic. And actually trained a lot of the logicians that were professors and basically taught logic all over the world. Um, so the Tarski's word is defined as follows. You have a set of uh, uh, blocks of different uh, 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 shapes, sizes in some cases, and colors located on a grid. So we can actually see here that we have the blue triangle A, the black uh, the circle B. We also have squares like the blue square E and so on. So we have blocks of various shapes and colors located in a grid. And in fact, in this example, I'm not using sizes. So I will just take it out. It makes it much easier to, to understand. Okay. And now we write logical formulas over this word. So for all t in geometric objects, the domain of Tarski's word is all the geometric objects present in our figure. The tri uh, t being a triangle implies that t is blue. So now remember how did we write this universal quantifier? It was a conjunction of all of the implications in our case for uh, all the geometric objects. If that geometric object is a triangle, then that geometric object is blue. So basically what this really says, if we take only the triangles and we push it in, it says that all the triangles are blue. So we have the, uh, as triangles, the following objects, A, C, and G. Is it true that the geometric objects A, C, and G are uh, blue? Yes. So actually that is a true uh, quantified formula. Uh, through universal conditional statement. Similarly, for all x, blue of x implies triangle of x. This basically says that all of the blue geometric objects are triangles. And immediately we can find a counterexample. E. E is a geometric object that is blue, but it is not a triangle. Therefore, that universal conditional statement is false. We found a counterexample, which is the geometric object E. Another logical formula, for every y such that square of y and d is to the right of y. So this basically states that there exists a geometric object uh, y. Uh, I think I said for all, but actually this is there exists. There exists a geometric object y such that y is a square and d is to the right of that square. So let's actually look for d first. So we have a, b, c, d. So now we are asking, is, is it true that d is to the right of uh, some square y? And right of really means right or on the same column 
with uh, with uh, basically the, those two elements are right, uh, these to the right of uh, y or on the same column, and we can see that we can we do have the, this square j that is on the same column. We actually are going to learn the meaning of this. I I have it later. The meaning of every predicate, including this binary predicate, right off. Next, there exists a, a, a geometric object Z, such that Z is a, a square and is gray. And we do have a, we don't have a gray square. In fact, if you iterate over all of the squares, E, H, and J, they have only two colors, blue or black. So there is no gray square. So therefore that statement is false. So now we can have statements with multiple quantifiers. So now we can actually see a universal existential statement. For all triangles X, there is a square Y such that X and Y have the same color. So is it true that for every triangle, I can find a square of the same color? So let's iterate over the triangles. So the triangles are D, F, and I. So now the universal statement says, for every one of these, one by one, can I find a square of the same color? So given the triangle D, yes, I can find E. It is also gray, uh, black. Then if I'm given either, either the triangles F or I, I can immediately find H or G being squares of the same color. So this universal existential statement is true because for every triangle, I can find at least one square of the same color. Okay. Another example in which existential quantifier comes first. There is a triangle X such that for all the circles Y, X is to the right of Y. So which are the triangles? We basically see there is a triangle D, there is a triangle F, there is a triangle I. Now we can choose that existential quantifier triangle to be either D or I. So let's choose D, they are on the same column. Is it true that for all the circles, the triangle D is to the right of those circles. And that is true because there are three circles, A, B, and C. And the triangle D is to the right of all those circles. So this existential universal statement is also true because there exists one element, in our case D, for which all of the elements in uh, all the circles have that property that X is to the right of Y. So how do we interpret basically statements with order of quantifiers, with different order of quantifiers? So now we basically have that example. For all X in the domain D, there exists a Y in the domain E such that P of X. The meaning of this statement is that for whatever element X you must find at least one element Y that works for that particular X. So really this Y is a function of X because you basically want a Y that works for that X that you chose one by one. If we swap the two quantifiers, so now we have there exists an X in the domain D such that for all of the Y in the domain E, P of X, Y works. The statement actually has the following meaning. Find exactly one or at, at least one particular element X that will work no matter what Y you choose in the domain E. So basically the moment that you swap the quantifiers, you are actually getting a different meaning. And you can actually see it in, in we will see it in Tarski's word that we can state a sentence for every circle, there is a triangle to the right of it. 
But once you swap the two quantifiers, you're saying there exists a triangle that every circle is to the right of it. And there are two different statements, okay? We'll see another example. So let's assume that we have a cafeteria in a university uh, that has multiple stations. So we have salads, which contain multiple dishes, two dishes, green salad and fruit salad. There is the station called main courses, where we have spaghetti and fish. There is the station for desserts, where we have pie and cake. And there is the station for beverages, where we have milk, soda, and coffee. And we have three students, Uta, Tim, and Yuan. And each one of them selects some of the items. So we can have a predicate uh, uh, eats. Uta eats, and then you, you can see that she's choosing a green salad, spaghetti, pie, and milk. Okay. So now let's look at a couple of logical statements. And you can also see other examples, like for instance, Tim chooses fruit salad, fish, pie and cake, and milk and coffee. And Yuan is not, doesn't choose anything from salads. Uh, Yuan chooses spaghetti and fish, pie and soda. And now we are given a bunch of statements. There exists an item I, such that for all the students S, S chooses I. So is there an item that is chosen by all the uh, students? And you can immediately see pie. So pie is an item that all Uta, Tim, and Yuan chose pie. Okay? So that existential statement is true. There exists one item, at least one item. In this case, is exactly one because there is no other item that is chosen by all the students. But there exists an item that works for all of the students, that basically is chosen by all of the students. Second statement, there exists a student S such that for all the stations, there exists at least one item such that the student chooses that item. So this statement has three quantifiers. It says that there exists a student that for all the stations chooses one item. There exists an item in each station that the stu student chooses. And again, it's a true statement. We can see that in fact, both Uta and Tim can be that student. So Uta is that exists student that for all of the stations, she chooses at least one item for every station. Tim is another example for that existential statement. So Tim is a student that chooses for all of the stations, at least one item for every station. Now, for all of the students S and for all of the stations Z, there exists an item such that S chooses uh, that item. So now this statement is actually stating that every student for every station and every station, an item is chosen by uh, the student, by, uh, uh, by the student. And we can actually immediately find a counterexample. Yuan is a student for which there is no item chosen from salads. So we can see that if we say S is equal with Yuan, the inner statement for all of the stations that exist an item that Yuan chooses is false because Yuan does not choose anything from salads. Okay. Any questions? By the way, again, ask any questions. We'll basically uh, respond to them unless you want to wait until the end when I read the questions. So there was one question. Is it true that P is a necessary condition for Q? We say P implies Q. No, that would only be true if P were sufficient condition. Exactly. Necessary is the other way around. Is Q implies P. That basically means that P is necessary for Q, it means that if Q implies P, that it couldn't be the case that P was false if P if Q was true. Okay, excellent. Thank you. And that's the only question that I see in the chat. So we can return back. 
Okay, good. So now let's return to the Tarski's word with multiple quantifiers. So we have another statement for all the triangles X, there exists a square Y such that X and Y have the same color. So is it true that for all the triangles, we can find a square that have the same color with uh, the triangle? And that's true. If we choose the triangle uh, D, we can find the square E. If we choose the triangles F and uh, 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 I, when we choose those other two triangles that cover all the triangles, we can choose the square H. So this universal existential statement is true. Now let's swap the two quantifiers. So the statement now is there exists a triangle such that for all the circles Y, X is to the right of Y. Now the question is, is there a triangle such that for all the circles, X is to the right of Y? And we can choose D or I. So we can choose a triangle D such that for all the circles A, B, and C, uh, D is to the right of A, B, and C. Okay. Now, when you apply negation to multiple quantified statements, you basically have to apply the negation from left to right on one quantifier at a time. So let's assume that we have the original formula for all X in the domain D, there exists a Y in the domain E, such that P of X, Y is true. The negation of that, once pushed over the existential quantifier is, uh, over the universal quantifier is there exists an X in the domain D, such that the negation of the inner formula is true. But then we can still push the negation up to when negation only uh, applies to uh, uh, atoms, to basically predicates. So now we push the negation past the existential quantifier and we get there exists an X such that for all Y in the domain E, not P of X is true. And similarly, if we have, an ex uh, if we have a negation of an existential universal statement, it becomes a universal existential statement of the negation of the inner formula. So you push from left to right the negation over the quantifiers and this swaps the quantifiers from universal to existential and vice versa. So let's assume that we have a sentence in Starsky's word. For all squares X, there is a circle Y such that X and Y have the same color. Again, we push the negation over the universal quantifier. It becomes there exists a square X such that the negation of the inner formula is true. But now the negation of there exists a circle becomes a universal for all circles Y, X and Y do not have the same color. And now the question is, which one was true? The original formula that for all the squares, we can find a circle of the same color or its negation. So let's look at the original formula. Is it true that for all the squares, so which are the squares? The squares are E, G, and H. Is it true that for every square, we can find a circle of the same color? We can immediately find a counter example, which is E. There is at least one, which is E, that is not of the same color. E is black and there is no circle of the same color. And then the negation should have been true. And the negation says that there exists a, a square, which is E, such that for all of the circles, X and Y do not have the same color. And that's true. There is the square E, such that there is no circle that has the same color with E. So basically, for all of the circles, they don't have the same color with E. Okay. Another example. There is a triangle X is the original uh, uh, statement such that for all the squares Y, X is to the right of Y. The negation of that is for all the triangles X, the negation of the inner formula. So we pushed once the negation and we get a universal quantifier instead of the existential quantifier. And now the negation of the universal quantifier, the inner negation, is there exists a square Y such that the, the negation of the inner statement, X is not to the right of Y. So now let's look at the negation. So it says, actually, let's look over the, at the original formula. Is it true that 
there is a triangle X such that for all of the squares, X is to the right of uh, Y. Is there a triangle? And we look at the triangles. Is there a triangle that is to the right of all the squares? I cannot find one. Let's look at the negation. Is it true that for all the triangles, there is a square that is not to the right of the triangle? Is it true that for all of the triangles, and again, we have the three triangles, I can find a square that is not to the right of, that uh, the triangle is not to the right of that square? Yes, I can find H, for instance, for all of these triangles. And is uh, the triangle, actually, no, I can find G for all of these triangles, such that the triangle is not to the right of G. They are to the left of G. Also, the quantifier order is important. So let's look at these two sentences where the only thing that I did, I swapped for every square with there exists a triangle. So the first statement is, for every square, there is a triangle such that they have the same color. So is it true that if I take the squares one by one, so for E, I can find the triangle D, for H and G, I can find the triangle F. So this statement is true. It's, it's true that for every square, I can find a triangle of the same color. But what about the statement that says that there is a triangle such that every square has that co the color of that triangle? And uh, the, the, every square have, has a different color than that triangle. And that's not true because you cannot find a triangle, no matter which one you choose, you choose D, I, uh, it's not true that uh, for every square, it has a different color than D, because I can choose E and it doesn't have the different color. Similarly, for F I, uh, and I, I can choose uh, G and F and G or I and G do not have the same, uh, uh, they, uh, they, it's not true that they have different colors. So, we can basically see that by just swapping the two quantifiers, we are getting an opposite true value for that statement. So that's why it's so important, the order of quantifiers. Logic is very unambiguous. So you cannot have make a mistake with uh, logical reasoning. Now, in order to actually formalize with predicates, start his word until now we did it in English. I actually use uh, predicates. So triangle X means X is a triangle. Circle X means X is a circle. Square X means X is a square. Blue X means X is blue. Gray X means X is gray. Black X means X is black. Right of X, Y means X is to the right of Y, what I actually meant at the beginning. Above X, Y means X is above Y. Same color X, Y means X has the same color as y and x is equal with y means that x is equal with y basically they are the same object okay and that's because i want to write formulas in pure uh, quantified logic uh, so basically when i state a statement like this one i stated that for all circles x x is mm -hmm. above the actual circle f go Sorry, ahead a question um is the for the statement x is above y, the, if x and y are in the same row, does that, does, does the yes. statement true? Yes, if you remember, if you remember at the beginning, I do did have an example in which uh, a block was above, uh, right off another block, but it was only true if they are in the same column. So yes, Right of means is inclusive the current column. So right of means in the current column or to the right of. And similarly with above. It's probably not the most intuitive meaning, but this is the one using the textbook. And I don't want to go too far from the textbook. So I want the textbook to be our reference uh, manual. No? OK, thank you. Welcome. So I know that because I saw that original example where we did have a problem, like uh, if that was not the case, then uh, the formula couldn't have been true. And I do agree with you that it is a bit 
confusing because uh, that's the example where I realized that is the case. Because in most general cases, when you say that something is above something else, you actually mean really above, not at the same level, no? Uh, but, but that's what the convention that they make in the textbook. I will, make, I will be very explicit when I actually have, uh, when I will actually describe this in the exam, if such a problem, and there is high probability that such a problem exists in the exam, that the meaning of right off and above includes uh, at the same row or at the same column, okay? So let's look at this example. What this example says is that for all X, if X is a circle, then X is above F. So let's see where is F. F is right in the third uh, row. And the statement says that, is it true that for all circles, they are above F? And that's completely true. Yes. Uh, all the circles, and we have three circles, A, B, and C, they are above the object F. And maybe it's not a bad idea if I I'll size F. So there is no confusion about uh, which are variables, like the ones that are plain uh, text and the ones that are italicized, okay? Now let's look at the negation. Let me do the same below. I will update the lecture notes as soon as I finish the class. So you can basically just uh, take the latest version. So the negation of that universal statement that we had above is there exists an X such that the negation of the inner formula is true. And then uh, the negation of the implication is circle of X and not above X F. So now we analyze the original sentence and we identify that is true. So let's actually see if that the negation is false. There exists a circle that is not above uh, F. And we can see that is not true. The original sentence was true because I cannot find the circle that it is not above F. In fact, all of the circles are above F. Okay. Any questions? Okay. Next, there is a square X such that X is black. So my original sentence is that there exists a square that is black. And we can see that the original sentence was true because I can name that square to be E, that object to be E, and then E is both a square and black. The negation of this existential statement is a universal statement of the inner of the negation of the inner formula. And from conjunction by De Morgan, negation of a conjunction is the disjunction of the negations. So is it true that for all objects, they are either not square or they are not black? It's not true. I can give a, as a counter example E. E for E, this disjunction is not true. It's not true that not square of E or not black of E. Uh, not square of E is false, not black of E is false. Therefore, the disjunction is false and the universal quantifier is false. So the original statement was actually true. Next, for all circles X, there is a square Y such that X and Y have the same color. So first thing that I did, I wrote it in logic. For all X, circle X implies there exists a Y such that square of Y and same color X with Y. So it's a universal existential, universal conditional existential statement. Now, it is true that we can actually push out this existential uh, uh, quantifier here because circle of x does not use y so you can actually move the quantifier outside because you don't uh, quantify over the uh, you don't use the variable y outside so now the negation of that statement was the existential existential statement of the in negation of the inner formula then the implicate negation of the implication becomes circle of x and the negation of the conclusion of that implication the negation of the existential statement becomes a universal statement of the negation. And then the negation of a conjunction becomes a disjunction of the negations. So let's actually see the truthness of the original formula. The original formula was 
for all the circles i can find an object that is a square and is of the same color with the circle so is it true that no matter what circle i choose i can find the square of the same color and i can already tell you that that's not true because it's not true for the circle a so if a is the variable x a circle of a is true implies there exists a square that is of the same color with a there is no such square so it's false true implies false is false and now the universal quantifier becomes false because there was one at least one case there are actually two no 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 actually it is true because i just see that there is the square j sorry i didn't notice it so let's take a look so there are three circles a b and c a and c are blue and for them i can find j excellent and b is gray and for it i can choose either h or g so the original statement is true is true that for all geometric objects x if x is a circle it implies that there exists a geometric object y that is a square and has the same color with x the negation of that statement the original statement is there exists a geometric object such that the geometric object is a circle and for all of the geometric objects y y are either not a square or is not of the same color with x and now we can actually look back and say is there such a case if i choose x to be a then i cannot uh, i can uh, then for all y i can in this instance shade y to j and now we basically have uh, false because it's not true that y is not a square or it doesn't have the same color with a okay so we can see that the negation is false and the original statement was true good next statement there is a square x such that for all triangles y x is to the right of y so now there exists x such that x is a square and so in existential statements you see that you have the quantifier as and and in universal uh, in the implications or uh, you in universal statements you see that the co connective is an implication so there exists a square such that for all and uh, uh, such that for all geometric objects y if y is a triangle then x is to the right of y so let's take a look at is this true or false so is there a square such that for all triangles that all the triangles are that y that x is to the right of all the y's is there a square let's say what if the square is e such that for all the triangles e is to the right of is not true but i can choose g or j so g is a square and for all of the triangles g is to the right of those triangles it works okay so basically we can see that it is indeed the case the negation of this existential statement after pushing in the negation is a universal statement of the negation of the inner formula for that uh, original formula then the negation of the conjunction becomes a disjunction of the negations the negation of the universal statement becomes an existential statement of the negation of the inner formula the negation of the implication becomes uh, a conjunction between triangle of y and the negation of right of x y and if the original formula was true this must be false and we can actually see that what this says is that for all of the uh, geometric objects they are either not squares or there is a triangle that the that right of uh, that x is to the right of y is not true it was easier to uh, reason about the original statement so if that was true then the negation is false now let's continue so there is a programming language which actually maps directly 
to this kind of uh, logical statements that we have in first order logic. And that is called program prologue, programming in logic. And in fact, Stony Brook is uh, very famous for its prologue system. It's called XSB prologue. SB stands for Stony Brook prologue. It's developed for the last uh, 30 years. And basically it's a programming language where everything you write is a logical formula. It has features that very few uh, prolog systems have, with one of them being tabling uh, and basically other extensions to object-oriented programming and uh, higher, higher level logics. And if you are interested in them, you can basically contact me. I'm working in this area as my research area. But here we can actually see that what we represented be, be before with uh, logic uh, formulas, we can represent as a program. And really, these are, this is a program that you can take in Prolog and ask queries, and it will respond, basically, if they are true. And if they are true, they will tell you which ones of them are true. I will skip this part. I will not ask questions about Prolog, of course, it's not part of our material, but it is uh, covered in the textbook for a few pages. If you are interested, again, you can contact me, but it's not required for uh, the exams. Okay. Now, last issue that I want to cover in quantified statements are logical arguments. So earlier today, in a different lecture, we talked about logical arguments or inference rules. And we basically learned modus ponens, modus tollens, specialization, transitivity inference rule, uh, specification, and so on, uh, specialization, generalization, and so on. Today, we'll talk about the same kind of logical arguments, but for quantified statements. And the first logical argument that you can use for quantified statements applies to quantified statements specifically. It's called universal instantiation. If some predicate is true for everything in a set, then it is in particular true for any particular thing in that set. So when we have statements like all men are mortal, in fact, we can immediately instantiate the predicate uh, with the argument Socrates. And that's how we are obtaining through modus ponens that Socrates is mortal. So in fact, I should actually write that. So all men are mortal. Really what I did here by universal instantiation is if Socrates is a man, then Socrates is mortal. And this is really what universal instantiation does. It takes a universal formula that applies for all of the elements in a domain and instantiates it for a specific case, for one of the elements in that domain. Or in this case, actually, this is an implication. It's, it specifies that for every such object in the, uh, in particular, uh, Socrates in the universe, if Socrates is in a man, then it's mortal. Okay? And then we can get to universal modus ponens. So universal modus ponens looks like the propositional modus ponens. In the case of the propositional modus ponens, we said P implies Q and P was true, therefore Q is true. In the quantified version of modus ponens is for all X, if P of X implies Q of X, and P of A is true, then Q of A must also be true. So really what the informal, if you want to read it in English, it's if X makes P of X true, then X makes Q of X true is true. A makes P of X true, therefore A makes also Q of X true. And as an example, for all numbers, if X is an even number, then its square is also an even number. And k is an even number for some particular number k, then k is a, a square. Uh, the square of that k is also an even number. 
And that read in English is basically what we have here. Okay. Then we have the universal modus tollens. So the modus tollens basically says that for all x, if p of x, then q of x, then we have not q of a, therefore not p of a must be true. And as an example, if x is human, then x is mortal. Let's say that that's the meaning of h and m. Then if not mortal zeus, we can infer not human zeus. So basically, we are using directly modus tollens to uh, instantiate for a specific example, which is zeus, and then basically infer uh, a formula that, that zeus is not human. And the same way that we had validity of formal arguments, of logical arguments for propositional logic, we also have it for quantified statements. So there are these kind of arguments like modus ponens, modus tollens, transitivity, which are valid arguments, but we may also have invalid arguments like converse error, where one makes actually an assumption that converse is the same with implication. So an argument form is valid if and only if for any particular predicate substituted for the predicate symbols in the premises, the resulting, if the resulting premise are all true, then the conclusions are also true. And what are used for proving in most cases the validity of logical arguments are Venn diagrams. And here I can show you a couple of examples. They are very easy to understand. We have the statement, all human beings are mortal. So we can represent basically uh, these two sets, the, the rule as sets. So we have human beings and mortal. And what you can see from the inner set being in the outer set is that everything that is within the set human beings, so every point, every element in the human beings is also immortal. So all the human beings are mortal. Maybe there are other things that are mortal, like animals or plants. So the major prom premise is that the human beings is a set within the outer set of mortals. Then we have the fact that Zeus is not a mortal being. So Zeus is outside the set mortals, which is the minor premise. If you put together the two different diagrams, you are getting that Zeus is outside mortals, which is a bigger set than human beings, which is inside mortals. Therefore, Zeus is also outside human beings. So Zeus is not a human being. So Venn diagrams is basically a, a way to show that this argument forms are actually valid argument forms. Here we have another example. So the first statement is the same. All human beings are mortal. So human beings is a circle within the mortal circle. We know that Felix is mortal. But now there are two possible ways to combine the two diagrams. One way in which Felix uh, uh, goes inside human beings and one in which Felix goes outside human beings subset. So now this actually shows that the conclusion Felix is a human being is not necessarily true because it can be the case when we do put the two diagrams together that Felix is not a human being. So it actually shows that this is an invalid argument form. Now, diagrams can be used basically for valid diagram, valid uh, uh, proof of valid argument forms and proofs of invalid argument forms. So let me show you another example for proving validity. No polynomial function has horizontal asymptotes. And the function has a horizontal asymptote. Therefore, this function is not a polynomial function. So first statement says that no polynomial functions have horizontal asymptotes. And we represent it as two distinct disjunct sets. 
So polynomial functions and functions with horizontal asymptotes are separate. Then we are stating that a function, which is this function, has horizontal asymptotes. And when we look at this diagram, we can see that this function is outside the set of polynomial functions. Therefore, this function is not a polynomial function. So we can directly use Venn diagrams to prove logical arguments. We don't have to map them directly to modus tollens or to modus ponens. Modus tollens was actually the one used in this case. Another logical argument that is valid is the universal form of transitivity. So if you remember, transitivity was P implies Q, Q implies R, therefore P implies R. And similarly, in the quantified form, for all x, p of x implies q of x. And for all y, q of x implies r of x. Therefore, for all x, p of x implies r of x is a logical conclusion. And as an example from Tarski's word, if we are given two statements, all the triangles are blue, and all of the objects that are blue are to the right of all the squares, we can actually infer another implication. All the triangles are to the right of all the squares. So we can actually use these two implications in the premises to obtain another implication in the conclusion. And now I will give you two errors that can be, uh, that you basically are prone to actually make when you write logical uh, formulas. And those are the uh, basically logical arguments. And those are the converse error in quantified form uh, and the inverse error in quantified form. So the formal version is as follows. For all x, p of x implies q of x. And we know that q of a is true. We cannot infer that p of a must have been true. Maybe because maybe something else made q of x true. It didn't have to be P of A, okay? So as we can see in this example, you cannot use such a logical argument because it would be an invalid conclusion. And usually it's called converse error because this is actually the converse you would use in order to obtain P of A that Q of X implies P of X, but that's not what this rule says. Also the inverse error. So the inverse error, is the following argument that is invalid. For all x, p of x implies q of x, and p of x is false. We cannot use neither modus ponens or modus tollens to infer that not q of a is uh, true. So again, it's called the inverse error because if you would use the inverse, not p of x implies not q of x, then you would get that kind of a conclusion. But that's not what the original premise was. So it's basically a different premise. That's all about logical arguments and, in fact, uh, quantified logic. One thing that I want to make sure, and I will return back to the beginning, is first time I used write off if it was correct. So let's look again at this example, and I will italicize D because it's, in fact, one of the objects. So what this example says is that there exists a y such that is a square and d is to the right of y. So is there a square that is to the right of d? And we can actually see that the only way that this is true is that elements in the same column are considered to be uh, uh, basically uh, right off. Okay, so I don't want to create any kind of uh, confusion what right off and above really means. So I will take out this example because from what we saw, all of the other examples in the, in the lecture notes considered uh, that strict is correct. So, and just I will take it out and I will make sure that when I define the predicates, I mean strictness. And in that case, we basically always refer to strict cases. So really, above means 
strictly above and to the right of means strictly to the right of. And actually, if I uh, uh, put the first one being above, then right off, that it's basically fine. We can leave it like this. Okay. That's all basically from this set of lecture notes. And let's see if there are any questions. I see no questions in the chat. So I will basically save the recording and We'll continue.